So it's another Folklore Friday episode. What are we talking about today, Hannah? Mermaids. You heard it here first. Mermaids. Life's much better down where it's wetter. Okay, so as Hannah said, we're going to be talking about merfolk today. So we've chose a couple of monster manuals. Well, Hannah's chose them. The AD&D Second Ed Monster Manual and the 5th edition D&D Monster Manual. So Hannah, why have you chosen these two monster manuals in particular? Uh, simply because that's the one that we had way back when I first started playing D&D. That's the second ed one, yeah. Yeah, so it's the older version and this is the current version. Okay. So if you want to take a look at that one first... Okay, yeah. So in the AD&D Second Ed Monster Manual, it describes mermen as marine-dwelling amphibious humanoids with the upper torso of a human and the lower torso of a fish. According to this, they were once human but were transformed by unknown powers into their current form. They live by herding fish, but during times of need, they may have been known to attack other sea peoples and aquatic races, etc. Their adult mermen are six to... Sorry, five to six feet long and weigh between 150 and 225 pounds. Their skin tone can vary. Their hair colour is usually dark brown, occasionally fair. Their scale colour ranges from green to silver. Females are a little bit shorter than the males and weigh a little bit less. They adorn themselves with coral and shell decorations. They speak their own language. They're well armed, like tridents, uh, crossbows, presumably adapted for working underwater, and javelins. They can use grapples to attack ships. They can throw up to 50 feet. However, they do suffer double damage from fire attacks. And there's a little bit in the Habitat and Society, basically, where for every 20 mermen encounter, there's a patrol leader who's slightly tougher, you know, more hit dice. For every 40 mermen, there is a leader who has four hit dice. And for every 120 mermen, there's one chief, six hit dice, and two guards with four hit dice. For every 10 mermen, there is a 10% chance of a shaman, who is a three hit dice merman with the spells of a third level priest. They've got regular undersea communities, usually reef or sort of cliffs, honeycomb with passages. Um, occasionally, it says about 10% of the time, they may construct a village from seashells and coral. Their society is heavily patriarchal. They prefer to be left to themselves and usually reject proposals of friendship or trade. They're very territorial and whilst closely related to humans, they don't particularly like humans. In their ecology section, it tells us they're omnivorous, but they prefer a diet of fish, lobster, crab and shellfish. They don't cook these creatures, but they fillet them before eating. They can survive out of water for one hour before they begin to dehydrate. When dehydrated, they lose two hit points per hour and they will die within reach zero. Immersion in fresh or salt water immediately restores these lost hit points. They have an average life expectancy of 150 years and they have many natural enemies, but particularly hate the Sahagwin and the... Ixilaquatl, I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm sure, and they often clash with tritons over territory. And the artwork shown in here is the traditional mermaid yeah, wearing the fish scale bra. Straight off a sailor's arm, isn't it, really? Yeah, fishtail, sort of attractive female upper body wearing the fish scale bra, long hair, coral. You all know what a traditional mermaid looks like. So, I can just see by glancing over at the artwork in the 5th edition book that they've taken a bit of a different tact there. So why don't you tell us about the 5th edition version? This one looks a lot like the ones in the Harry Potter movie. Um, She's got fins where you'd have hair normally on a mermaid. She's got big webbed fingers. She's completely blue all over and completely scaly all over. And And she's got a long fluke rather than... A uh, fish tail. Yeah, and I was going to say, and of course it's modern artwork, so they've got the the sort of massive like wow elf ears that uh, oh, t- yeah, tend yeah. to proliferate on a lot of modern fantasy art. Yeah, I can see they've also got sort of like webbed fingers as well on the sort of humanoid part. Mm-hmm. So the the human part looks noticeably less human than it did previously. And something that I'll point out that I'll come back to in a bit is the way she's got this like weird belt thing that's actually pressing down several of her fins and this like bag slung over her shoulder which only makes sense if she happens to be I think, I think that might be like a fish shell funny. like it looks like some sort of shell whatever it is it's slung sort of either over this shoulder or onto her belt yeah now that's great while she's in this upright position yeah when as you're soon as she along. tips over to start swimming that's going to be causing all kinds of drag. But anyway. 
Yeah, and I presume having like your fins pressed down wouldn't be tremendously helpful. Yeah. So in stats, they're not dissimilar, although they are very simple creatures as yeah. far as like D and D creatures go. Mm-hmm. Uh, the stat block itself is quite small. Um, Does it tell us any more about their background or anything different? Uh, no. Well, it doesn't tell us any more. It tells us different. Uh, or rather it doesn't tell us that they've specifically come from human races they just exist and they don't really like humans yeah um it does tell us which i also sort of made me like think about it a bit that they lack the materials and the practical means to forge weapons to write books and keep law or to shape stone to raise buildings. Well, fair enough, they probably are going to be lacking the means to forge weapons. So they're going on that more sort of tribal As, that vibe there, are they? Well, yeah, they're, they're very much doing a hunter-gatherer thing and living in caves or um, in, like, bits of coral or in the ruins of human cities that have sunk under the sea. Right, OK, yep. Um, but it strikes me that it, if even if they've not got the means to make metal tools, that doesn't mean they haven't got the means to make big blocks of stone if they so wish to. Yeah. You can do that underwater, and there's probably like a million ways that you could utilise various natural features to make it easier to do. All you need is some sand and some string. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I'm aware, you can actually make metal tools without like fire and... I mean, it's easier to, like, make metal tools with fire, don't get me wrong, but you do have, like, iron tools where they've been, like... They've not used the traditional, like, forge. So you'd think if they're in, like, a magical, fantastical world, mm-hmm. like, like D&D is, that they may have, over the bajillions of years they've no. been in the sea, found a way around it. The other thing to consider, though, when you're thinking about merfolk using metal tools is why would they want to use metal tools? No, that's a good point. What, yeah. what what use is metal when you live underwater? It Especially goes, like rusty and corrodes and disintegrates yeah, if you're in salt really water. quickly. Yeah, yeah. Whereas a nice sharp seashell will do everything that your metal knife will do. Yeah. Plus, it's lighter weight, so it's not going to cause as much drag on you while you're trying to move about. I suppose potentially as well you've got the same problem with wood because we've all seen like mm-hmm. pictures of like shipwrecks you know where after a while the wood just starts crumbling away and it gets all like eaten away well, by yeah, any tools that they were going to use they would have to make specifically for themselves and yeah. I don't think they'd be using human materials very often because human materials just wouldn't be useful yeah, I expect in the... I mean, you're absolutely right, but I expect in the earlier D, AD&D book, it was just done to be, like, simple. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, we're, we haven't got time to, like, put in, like, a whole separate thing for, like, aquatic, like, underwater weaponry and whatnot. <laughs> They've got some manner of crossbow that works underwater because it's a Murphy oh, crossbow. Oh, yeah, for, for the sake of your game, you can say, oh, they've got a water one of these. But it just sort of struck me as something interesting... I expect that's the same reason why they've got the um, like the trident as one of the weapons. Because if you actually think about it, whilst we we associate the trident, because you know, like Neptune and Poseidon, mm-hmm. we associate it with the water. If you're actually like permanently living underwater, what are the chances you would make a metal trident? Well, not particularly high, I don't think. Even if you were going to make something because... vaguely similar, I'd expect it to be more like a sort of simple spear. Well, yeah, I mean. Mm... But even See, that doesn't seem too plausible. The reason that your trident has three points is because that makes it easier to cope with the that thing that makes you straw look bendy. What's it called? Refraction. Refraction in the water. So you aim at your fish and you try and get your middle spike in your fish and the spikes at either side sort of account for the refraction. Wouldn't that be more the case when you were trying to, like, but you're above water, fishing into water? But you're a human above water throwing a trident at a fish. Yeah. A mer person underwater can see that fish fine, doesn't yeah. need those extra two spikes causing more drag on their weapon. Uh, and even if there was some sort of visual distortion underwater, which we know there is because water's not entirely transparent, but you'd assume they've adapted to it. I mean, we know fish of various animals 
that live in the water have adapted over the hundreds of years they've been in the real world. So you'd assume like merfolk who've evolved to be sort of like civilised, so this whole society underwater would have also developed like the ability mm -hmm. to deal with that in some way. Mm -hmm. But it's also like how much would you bother to civilise you? you or civilize, how much technology would you bother to use? Yeah. Because it's all well and good having technology for a cart to take a big weight of stuff from one end of the country to the other. Mm -hmm. But if you're a mer person and you want to take a big load of stuff from one end of the sea to the other, a cart's not going to help you. An octopus might. Yeah. Or... Um, various sort of flotation type devices that you can construct that just lift it above to a certain level and then take you straight across but what why would you ever bother trying to construct something that you can sit in when you can just swim it's a valid point <laughs> valid point and obviously due to the buoyancy effect of water things which would be very heavy on land may be a lot easier to move underwater well yeah you, you could make use of quite a lot of things to shift stuff about if you so wish to. But again, why would you bother? Because the other thing yeah. is you've got various different animal migrations that are way more drastic than what we see happening with animals migrating on land. But we just we don't really think about it because we don't see it happening because we're humans but when like half of the creatures at the bottom of the ocean go all the way up to the top and back again every day or so yeah and if you if you're a merfolk and you want to eat something you don't have to go chasing after herds or building farms to keep those animals in place you, you just know where they are and you go and fetch them. Well, yeah, I mean, we see... And we see most of them will come to you at some point if you build your settlement in the right place. Yeah, I mean, we see we see fishermen do this in, like, the real world where mm. they know where the fish, like, sort of annual like, migrations or whatever are and they just put big nets in the way and just mm -hmm. let a load swim in. And, like, the ones were too small swim through the holes in the nets. So I can imagine merfolk doing that. I mean make it a net out of whatever material they've got to hand and then they just go yeah like like you said look we know where the fish sort of travel to and from let's just set up our nets and as long as you're not doing it on a ridiculous industrial scale you're not going to impact like a large population of marine life so drastically that you're going to deplete it especially not if you're doing like in a hunter gatherer sort of scale so yeah so we've talked a bit about it in D and D. What about um, merfolk in folklore? I can see you've got a bit of a so, bit of notes there. Obviously, the mermaid story that everybody knows is the Little Mermaid. That's right. Um, and most people know the Disney version, but I think by now as well, most people know the Hans Christian Andersen version. Yeah, the, or if at you, least that it ends quite differently. If you need to know, by the way, the Hans Christian Andersen one is the one without the catchy tunes in it. <laughs> Uh, um, that's the original story that he wrote and the ending which is quite different for me always struck me as so it's all the same right up to the point where she gets her legs and she goes to see the prince yeah the prince takes no interest he just sort of keeps her round like a pet he gets a human girlfriend right her sisters try and persuade her to kill him because he's broken her heart and she decides to stop stalking the guy that she's been stalking who's got no interest in her and moves on to another lie okay all right she dies and turns into sea foam and then she gets turned into like a air fairy but yeah i i quite like that story as just being that slightly different angle on it um, and it could be an interesting NPC to put into a game, somebody that was a mermaid but moved on for whatever reason, or was a whatever, yeah. Um, could be interesting as a player character as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I think my only potential issue with um, which you've neatly got around in that, obviously, normally if someone's like, hey, I want to play like a merman or a merfolk or whatever, first of all, you've got to think, well, how much of my campaign is going to be taking place in like in aquatic environments? Because mm-hmm. if you've got one person who's playing like a merman and the other people are like your normal sort of land going races, they're probably not going to get to like do their merman thing like as much as they mm-hmm. want to. Whereas, like you say, you're sort of transformed merfolk trying to move on and trying to do something different could be quite interesting and you don't really need extra stats for it because if you're a transformed merfo mm-hmm. the, the other name for them is human <laughs> so that got me on thinking about the other mermaid story that i know reasonably well okay which is you know the mermaid on the starbucks logo yeah so she's called melusine okay. or sometimes people say melusine I'm not going to argue about it. Her story is a bit weird and convoluted, but the moral of the story is basically let your spouse have their secrets. Okay, right. I'm intrigued. Tell me more. (laughs) First part of the story, there's a woman who agrees to marry a king under condition that he never visits her during childbirth. Oh, but that was a difficult sell. So she has two daughters... And then the king's chatting to his mates, and they're all like, oh, it's a miracle seeing the baby born. Oh, it's fantastic. Why haven't you seen your babies born? And he he decides to get nosy, and he goes into the room while she's having the third child. Because he broke his promise, the child is cursed to be a mermaid on Saturdays. Why Saturdays? That's a very complicated question that will lead us down a very dark YouTube rabbit hole. Let's say there's conflicting theories on it. Right, okay, fair enough. It's one of those, isn't it? <laughs> All right, so what, how does the rest of it go down? Um, so, child grows up and gets married, and she makes her spouse promise to let her be alone in her room on a Saturday. So he's got no clue she's a mermaid okay. on a Saturday, but she is only a mermaid on a Saturday. They agree to this. They have a couple of kids... One Saturday, he gets curious. Yeah, I think I see where this is going. (laughs) Goes into a room, sees her being a mermaid. She gets cross. She flies out the window. She curses the king. Hold on a second. Flies out the window? Yeah, yeah. She sprouts wings. Um, Right. Again, medieval folklore gets a bit weird and confusing. Yeah. (laughs) Sometimes she just jumps out the window into the river. Or sometimes she steals the children and goes out the window or whatever there's there's a million versions of this story yeah but basically the the myth is that she's a mermaid but she can't be seen to be one and then when she is that there are dire consequences causes dire consequences so, so you were saying like oh the, the moral of this is that like your spouses have the secrets i would have said the moral of this is like if you promise to do something like keep your word well that too because yeah. like because like both of them were like told like oh don't do this or like some bad stuff's <laughs> gonna go down and they were like yeah yeah it's fine we won't oh but 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 but, but I'm, I'm interested <laughs> i may should have thought of that beforehand but that is where you could have like an aquatic type creature that wasn't an aquatic creature to begin with. Yeah. Um, like a work replacement merman. Yeah. So the, you don't need a whole society of merfolk for a creature like her to exist. She's there because she's been cursed to be like that sometimes. And I, I suspect this is part of where they got Princess Fiona from. In um, Shrek. Shrek, yeah. But. That there's many different ways you could use that again for a story depending on who's a player character and who's an NPC in the scenario really okay. but yeah if you do want to have that merfolk society it's quite sort of interesting to look at as we were before how much technology do they have what are they using it for yeah um, I mean, is there like a merfolk black market in human goods because sometimes they are useful and people like the novelty and the fact that it's effectively going to disintegrate in a few months? So it's like, 
I, I love the yeah. fact you mentioned it as like a black market because like it almost makes it sound like there's like a social stigma amongst Murpho, you know, because they don't like humans, you don't want to rely on human okay. goods, but occasionally they're like, mm, yeah, but we could do with a little bit of something, something to Again, like sort this problem out. Is there a social stigma on it, or is it yeah. a highly prized like thing that if you were lucky enough to find a human bottle opener, you'd go rushing straight to your local Merlord to get the reward of whatever it might be it, it also brings up an interesting point of like is there any trade is there any trade between merfolk and humans because they might not like humans mm -hmm. but if they've got goods that you really need and you can't just like get out of the water and like walk across the land to get it yourself mm -hmm. you either go without or you find someone to trade with basically so what if there's like small groups of like maybe like coastal settlements or whatever where they do, they do a bit of like trade with them on the sly and I just want to like look back at these clothes on this merfolk again for a second, yeah, and point out how much drag that outfit's going to have. If your merfolk are going to be wearing clothes, they're going to be skin tight. If they're going to have ornamentation, it's going to be skin tight. Any of that kind of stuff is going to affect how how well you can swim and how well you can float. And, like, you've seen what happens with the fish in the fish tank if something goes wrong with their air bladder. And yeah, they can't like, balance properly. Yeah, so they can't right themselves, can they? Imagine that happening to a mer person because they've got a bag full of something tied to their waist. Yeah. You would be screwed. You, where, if it's enough of a problem for, like, the guppies in the fish tank without any um, filter or bubbles or anything in there think how much of a trouble it would be for a mer person in like the sea in the sea with all the currents and everything. yeah 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 all of that Take so you're gonna want stuff that's not just skin tight but also the same density as water if you're gonna want it at all tell you what i found weird about the the clothing on there is what's going on with that like top that the mer folks wearing on like his or her because i can't really tell upper half because that, to me, looks like the sort of garment I would expect to see, like, a, a female human wearing in, like, a fantasy art. Mm hmm Which doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, since this... Since I would expect that merfolk wouldn't have any need of having breasts. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, she does have rather big mammaries for a fish. Yeah, and, but, but, like, <laughs> weirdly, in the 5th edition version, half of her doesn't seem to have any breasts... <laughs> But the half that's covered by the yeah, cloth they, they obviously are on does. a bit of a wonk, although, it, in defence, having worn a top of that shape, they do tend to go on a bit of a wonk but, if you wear one. But, but it's a bit weird, though, because <laughs> I can understand, like, if, if you're going to draw breasts on, like, the picture, you've got to put a bit of cloth to, like, cover it, you know, censorship and whatever. Yeah, but, yeah, she's definitely got an upper and a downer there. But, but what I'm saying is, wouldn't it have been easier for them just to not put breasts on it and then not include that at all? <laughs> yeah. Because... Obviously, there's there's literally no reason for him to like have breasts, so there's no need for that <laughs> item of clothing. Why would they wear any clothing on their upper body? That makes yeah. no sense whatsoever. Absolutely, um, but yeah, we're we're not going to resolve whether or not mermaids should have boobies. You are more than welcome to put mermaids in boobies. If you want some bus some busty mermaids in your your setting, go ahead. But like, it looks weird as in the fifth edition monster manual. Yeah, yeah, you are more than welcome to put boobies on your mermaids and put them in whatever kind of underwear you like. That's it. But it would make sense if it was skin tight and the same density as water or extremely lightweight. That's it, like we say, if you want the Victoria's <laughs> Secrets mermaid, go, go for your life. But uh, like the, having like voluminous clothing or like sort of strange clothing doesn't make any sense. Yeah, uh, uh. And now that you've pointed out, having an upper and a downer on your fantasy costumes just never going to be comfortable, is it? And just looking at the picture, it was literally the first thing that jumped out to me because it looks weird. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, it if, is if like you, the right ones just sort of floating away. And, and don't get me wrong, if, if you're out there and you've got an upper and a downer, that's that's fair enough. <laughs> but yeah th this is extreme it's like one one's just sort of free hanging and the other one's in a wonder bra <laughs> so there you go red dice diaries keeping you abreast of all the things you need to know <laughs> having discussed the mermaid boobies on to um 
using them in D&D, which, couple of questions to ask yourself. First up, how much do you want the players to be able to interact with them? Yeah. Are they a random encounter on an ocean voyage for an otherwise unrelated story? Yeah. Or are they, like, the main other... um, I was going to say the main villains. They don't even have to be the main villains. Just an antagonist group in your campaign. Yeah. Um, Obviously, if they're just a random encounter, you don't want the player characters to be able to get in the water and talk to them and do stuff. Yeah, and you probably don't need to delve as deeply into their background (laughs) if it's just a bit of a random encounter. Indeed. But also, if you're going to put encounters like that in... You want to have a quick look at what your player characters already have access to, because if you've put this in, not expecting anyone to be able to go underwater and drowning to be a real threat, yeah, and then you discover that like your wizard's got a water breathing spell and your druid can turn into a dolphin, then it's suddenly a lot less of a difficult encounter than it was. Yeah, I think that's definitely something to bear in mind because although in 5th edition and um, the AD&D 2nd Monster Mind Monster Manual, you have sort of like the challenge rating or like equivalent. Obviously, that's not a really accurate representation when it comes to to merfolk when the player characters are potentially in an environment that's hazardous to them that they're not equipped for dealing with. And even if, let's say, you're the stereotypical like D&D fighter in like full plate mail armor with a mm-hmm. shield and a broadsword and all that malarkey, if you like get grabbed by a merfolk while you're on a ship and get dragged like under the sea even if you're lucky enough that like the wizard whaps a water breathing spell on you like as you're being pulled under you aren't going to be able to swim you're going to sink like a stone if this if you're in the sea and it gets really really deep like the pressure's going to crumple you like a tin can mm-hmm. and also let's say you let's say you manage to break free and somehow with some amazing, like, fluky roll, get out of your plate mail before you sink to the bottom of the sea and are crushed, you've still then got to swim back up to the surface in less time than it takes for that water-breathing spell to run out. And if any of those criteria are not met, you are done, son. Oh, and you just lost your massive, like, plate mail and probably the rest of your clothes and and anything else you had in your pockets. And that's assuming the merfolk are just trying to drag you underwater and they're not, like, shanking you at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because, like, we're assuming now that when you pull underwater, you're literally concentrating on holding your breath and taking your armour off. Now, that'd be difficult while you were sinking. If you're trying to fight someone off and you're getting stabbed and stuff like that being calm enough to like regulate your breathing or like hold your breath and get out of your armour while you're being attacked and defend yourself, that's going to be a hell of a lot more difficult. So, what would you use them for in your game, John? Me, I've got to admit, I would, there's a couple of ways I'd use them. The first would be random encounters, as you say. The players are on a ship sailing somewhere for whatever mission they're doing and couple of ideas they either just like see some merfolk off in the distance and like nothing else happens with it they just see them in the distance and that's mm-hmm. a cool like thing going like oh some of these old legends of the sea are true but you don't need to make any more of it the other would be they get attacked by merfolk for whatever reason they've wandered into their territory now that would be challenging because the players are on a ship the merfolk are in the water so it's going to be a ranged combat but it introduces some complications because let's say the merfolk are trying to wreck the ship from underneath what do you do about it because you can't just wade into the water and sort of deal with them but by the same token because they're not going to be insta able to like sink your ship it's going to take some time if you are the big beefy fighter in plate mail who's for some reason wearing plate mail while he's on the deck of a ship you can be like, oh, they're, they're like hole, putting holes in the bottom of a ship. We've got to go and deal with them. So that may give you time to like shrug out of your armour or drop some of your heavier stuff and then jump into the water. So there's a bit of warning provided. So it's not just like, boom, you're in the water, you're drowning, you're in plate mail. What are you going to do about it? And I think those would probably be the two main sort of ways I'd use them. The, the other one would be, you know, the sort of vaguely like Innsmouth-esque style so you don't have to go the whole like horror sort of hybrid vibe that um, Lovecraft did with Innsmouth, but 
having like an isolated coastal setting where maybe they're a bit more prosperous than you would otherwise expect or that seem they seem inexplicably wealthy based on the fact they just do a bit of fishing but like when you speak to the locals they're like oh they don't talk about it they're a bit closed lipped to outsiders and then maybe the players discover that the merfolk folk trade with these local people bringing them like pearls and stuff like that like precious stuff in return for human manufactured goods but because they don't want to deal with like loads of humans because they don't really like them they're like oh look if you tell anyone about this village or let any outsiders know the deal's off no more wealth for you we'll go elsewhere so in that case you're probably not dealing with the merfolk directly but if you start poking your nose in for whatever reason you're going to have to deal with these local people in this like coastal village who probably aren't evil as such but they know if they sort of let you in on this and the merfolk find out about it they're going to lose their revenue stream and they're going to be back to being a poor fishing village again so that could be an interesting little twist and if the player characters do find out about it what do they do about it can they persuade the merfolk they're like oh look it's only us extra four who know about it do you really need to know i'm thinking i'm reminded of that um star trek episode where they um they wipe everyone's mind on board the ship to prevent them finding out about the this type of aliens. Mm-hmm. But they like they leave a few clues and like Data works it out and the rest of them all work it out and then Data's like, Whoa, 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 we, we left some mysteries. Let's just do it again. Let's have a do over and let's get it right this time. Mm-hmm. So maybe you could persuade like the Murphy <clears throat> that like they could still keep their trade agreement going. I think that could be interesting, you know, a bit of socialising and a bit of a uh, negotiating at the end. My idea would be that you would have a mostly on land adventure. Okay. That would begin on a boat, as you say. Mm-hmm. The merfolk who often trade with the ship come and ask for some help. Some of our people, some of our stuff, whatever, has been stolen and taken to X Evil Guy's dungeon. Yep. Or to be part of X Evil Guy's menagerie. That's pretty cool. Off yeah. you go, players. Go and rescue our stuff. Come back and get a reward from us. I like that because that still gives you like a bit of your standard dungeon crawl, you know, to get into the menagerie, but also gives you the additional challenge. It's not just going, get gold, get out. It's like we've got to go in and we've got to get this like merfolk out who we've got to somehow keep in water. Then we've got to get them to the sea. And then you might be stuck with the thing of, oh, well, we, we've got this uh, polymorph or whatever that we can used to turn this merfolk into a human so they can survive the journey back to their family. We can't turn them back into a person again afterwards, but they'll be alive and they won't be a prisoner anymore. Tell you what you could do as well. What if we take your concept and you're like, oh, you've got into the menagerie, you've freed the merfolk, we're giving you another like, polyjuice potion to like turn them into a turn them into like a human. And um, there's some criteria they have to meet to like turn them back into a murphy let's say let's say just for a random example i'm pulling out my backside let's say they take this potion they become human until they touch salt water and then they turn back into a murphy mm-hmm. you go you then are like oh we're like two months away travel away from the sea or whatever so you got to take them back what if by the time you get back to the sea that murphy's like no i'm good i don't, I don't fancy <laughs> it actually the question yeah. You, know, you know what I've, I've been quite enjoying this human i quite like having like fire and like cooked food and stuff and yeah, it's been really good. I don't much fancy going back to being a merfolk. And as long as I don't touch salt water, that's grand. No, I'm good, thanks. And then the player characters go up to the merfolk and be like, oh, we tried, <laughs> but they, they don't want it. As if the merfolk are just going to buy that. They're, they're going to be like, a likely story. You've done something to them. You've brainwashed them. <laughs> something like that. And then you've got another potential like conflict brewing. Like, can you persuade the merfolk to go back to the sea? Is that even the right thing to do if they don't want to? You know, that could be a really great sort of like, I suppose, sort of social dilemma, sort of moral dilemma. If you want to get into that in your DD, we hope you've enjoyed this episode about merfolk, delving a bit into DD from a sort of older version and newer version viewpoint. And we've talked a bit about them in folklore and how we'd use them in our games. Perhaps you'd like to get in touch with us. We'd love to hear how you use merfolk and aquatic races in your games. You can do so in a few different ways. You can leave us a message on SpeakPipe. There's a link in the description. You can leave us a message on Anchor. Again, a link in the description. 
or you could send us an email to rdrpgpodcast at gmail.com and we might even feature your call in in a future episode we'd love to hear what you think and your suggestions for future folklore friday episodes so until we see you again take care bye bye Put it in the end after the credits.